Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, beautiful setting here, the Bellevue Arts Museum. I'm Vikram Jandiala. I'm Vice President of Innovation Strategy for the University of Washington. Welcome to uh, Commotion's Innovation Chat Series. This is the third in this series. The first uh, uh, talk was on uh, virtual reality and augmented reality, a very interesting discussion in Seattle. The second was in Spokane, talking about the innovation ecosystem in the state of Washington. And today we're going to be talking about uh, different aspects of cybersecurity. So a couple of words on uh, Comotion, which is the organization at the University of Washington that I lead. This is a collaborative innovation hub, the mission of which is to expand the societal impact of the UW community by developing and connecting to local and global innovation ecosystems. We do this through three ways. One is innovation transfer, which is taking the best ideas from the university out into the real world and into the market. The second is innovation learning, which is getting the best practices on how to innovate out to our community, our students, our faculty, and our staff uh, as they need it uh, in a just-in-time manner. And the third is applying this philosophy, sort of drinking the Kool-Aid on innovation ourselves and helping universities adapt to changing uh, environments, whether it's online courses, whether it's experiential learning. An example of that is the Global Innovation Exchange, which will be opening next year here in Bellevue in the Spring District, which is a new experiential learning model and a facility which Microsoft has been a kind sponsor in helping us put together, which will be a new mode for innovation uh, starting next year. Now for this event, Commotion is particularly proud to partner with UW Alumni Association for this special evening. So we're very excited to have our alumni and our friends here on the east side. This is our inaugural year of Innovation Chats, and we'll be tackling emerging themes, innovation, and groundbreaking solutions to some of the world's most pressing problems, but also looking at really timely problems. And that's certainly true of what we're going to talk about today, which is cybersecurity. We're going to talk about privacy and cybersecurity on an individual level, uh, from the safety perspective and from a public accountability stance. And hopefully we have a range of opinions, so I'm looking forward to a not very friendly chat, I hope. <laughs> uh, you can also, those of you who are Twitter savvy, please submit your questions to hash Como chat, C-O-M-O-C-H-A-T. Feel free to tweet, and I'll pull out my phone a few minutes after the lecture to, to take a look at them. And now, um, I'm just the moderator. We have three amazing um, folks here who understand privacy and security. So let me do a quick introduction uh, to them. Uh, far right is Ryan Kalo. He's an assistant professor at the UW School of Law and the Information School. Uh, he's also co-director of a very innovative lab at the university, which is a tech policy lab. And he's been in the news several times. Uh, a print edition of Wall Street Journal just came out yesterday talking about his views on drones which resonate with mine. I'm a drone enthusiast. I love flying my drones around. And what he said is that we don't want to curb innovation, so we want drones flying around everywhere. So, so that's great. Uh, and Maybe you disagree. But. <laughs> <laughs> and he also made it here in time. He was busy all day with a White House event on uh, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, a discussion at the University of Washington, which was very well attended. So Ryan, thank you for joining us. Next to Ryan is, is uh, David Oxsmith, who is chief scientist at Route 9B and a senior principal research scientist at University of Washington's Applied Physics Lab. He's a former officer in the US Navy, and he has written extensively on cyber crime, cyber espionage, and cyber warfare. So he really gets it, and I'm hoping that he will uh, be on the opposite side from some of the other folks today. <laughs> so thank you, David, for uh, providing your expertise here. And last but not the least, uh, Rich Sauer from uh, Microsoft. He's a corporate vice president and deputy general counsel for uh, CELASMSG at Microsoft. He's responsible for all legal, government, and community affairs activities undertaken outside the United States. Uh, I was lucky enough to travel with him to, to China uh, and uh, hear him in, in, uh, uh, in actually talking about very exciting stuff around cloud and big data at the uh, innovation Summit at Tsinghua University. And he uh, looks at global enforcement strategies which are developed to address internet safety, cybercrime attacks, intellectual property theft, and unfair competition issues. So with that, uh, let's get started. Um, let's jump in straight to questions that I have as an individual and I'm sure many people here would have. So this is really focused on the individual and I'm gonna start with Ryan. What's your general advice for people in the room and for people like me to protect their data? And does the cloud make things better or worse from that perspective? 
That's a that's an interesting opening opening question, right? Um, so I've I've argued in the past, and I think that this is true that um, uh, basically the market is a really good place to start in terms of protecting your data, um, both from uh, abuse by uh, companies and also by the government. Um, because the truth is, is that it's very difficult for us as individuals to resist surveillance. I mean, it's just so um, endemic to life in the digital age. And the only uh, entities that have proven really resilient against um, the threats that are posed by um, hackers and um, by foreign and, and even our own government, uh, potentially, um, as well as by uh, industry, um, has really been industry itself. And so what I would suggest to you is that as a person in the market with market power, as a consumer, that you would look for certain assurances from your providers. Right. Um, make sure that your data is um, being encrypted. Um, make sure that your uh, provider makes promises that will be enforced in terms of what they will do. Um, and so, you know, increasingly the marketplace is affording you a lot of different options. And I think being a thoughtful consumer and really um, going with the firms that are, are really thoughtful about privacy and security, uh, both in terms of what they would do and what uh, the government might do, is just a great place to start. Um, you know, we could talk all day sort of about, you know, different tips, you know, browsers you could use, browser modes, and so on. But at, at the end of the day, you know, if you really care about privacy and civil liberties, then you really should, um, you know, use, use your power in the marketplace uh, in order to try to incentivize um, better practices by, by corporations. Thank you, Ryan. David? So that, there's uh, no really simple answer to that question. As, as is typical with almost every question I suspect you're going to ask. Right. Um, if you look at keeping your data private or secure, there's sort of two issues to worry about. One is someone illegally taking it. That turns out to be particularly difficult nowadays as the bad guy, however you want to define that, is becoming increasingly sophisticated. Being able to protect yourself is really, really difficult. The best thing you can do is sort of, if you will, follow established practices. Don't do stupid things. The stupid things are you know, the really simple ones of the Nigerians are not going to give you a lot of money. Please don't <laughs> click on the Nigerian <laughs> link. Um, your IT, your email address is not about to expire. Please don't click on the link. It's the don't click on things that you don't understand issue and also do a little bit better password management than most people tend to do. Don't use the same password everywhere, et cetera. Uh, you have to you know, write down the password. Nobody's going to break into your house and steal them. Write them down. Use good ones. So that's job number one is to keep the bad guys out. And actually, the issue there is they're typically not going to break into you. They're going to break into companies you use and get your data that way, thus putting the onus, as was rightly put, on companies to do their job. But quite frankly, they're under considerable attack by very sophisticated people as well. There's also the issue of the data you give away for free. Uh, there's a very uh, common saying that says, if you aren't paying for the product, you are the product, right? So if you get a service for free, there's a reason you're getting it for free, which because they want to use that. You may be totally comfortable with that, but it needs to be a conscious decision you make. So to some extent, being conscious about what you give out and who you give it to should be part of life that you go on. So those are kind of two broad brushes. Rich, from the corporate side, what's your point? Uh, Do you I have think, to defend yourself as a... No, I think those are very good, very good answers. I'd, I'd add a couple glosses, I suppose. Um, one would be, and bear with me here, um, on Friday, I will fly to Ohio and I will uh, attend my mother's 90th birthday. Um, I will spend the weekend there and I guarantee what I will spend my time doing is I will be updating her computer. Um, so I will be downloading the latest patches and everything else. So in addition to passwords, in addition to... Is it to, an Apple or a Microsoft? Uh, it, it happens to be a Microsoft computer and, and, and it's a relatively up-to-date one. So I did, you know, the other piece I'd add probably is, is certainly, you know, 
uh, you know, when we, a lot of the security attacks we see when there are problems, it is in, invariably an unpatched, vulnerable device that is, that there is something out there that can, you know, be updated, but people haven't gotten around to, to doing that. And you mentioned we'd spend time in China. China is a place that I marvel at because this is a market where there are still about, I think our estimates are, this may still be a little bit high, but last I checked, there were 200 million PCs in China running something called Windows XP, which you may remember, um, but it's about 17 years old and it was a product that was a very good product at the time it was developed, but it's a product that was not developed for the, the current uh, threats that we're seeing um, all over the world. The other piece I'd go to is your, your, your sub-question around the cloud. Um, it is, this is, for those who don't know what that means, I mean, a cloud is essentially massive set of data centers spread around the world, um, which are essentially places where you can now have somebody else essentially provide your computing and your computing power and your storage uh, in a data center like we run. We have a, a very large facility in Quincy, Washington, not so far from here, near the Columbia River. Um, and. I spent a lot of time in my job talking to customers um, about cloud computing. And it's a, it, is a, it is a very significant part of our future and part of our, our go-forward strategy. And what I often tell them, and I'll sit with enterprise customers who have very uh, sophisticated IT departments, um, but these are customers, they're banks or they're department stores or they're, they're, they're companies that really what they do best if you're a bank, what you do best is you manage money. We are increasingly a data company. What we do best is we manage data, as does Amazon, you know, across the across the lake and Google, you know, in the valley. Um, so we, these companies in this space in this industry, we are competing for the best and the brightest in the world who know how to who, how to do security well. Um, and if you go into our data center in Quincy, Washington, first you'll the first thing you'll see it's surrounded by a huge fence. Um, that is, you know, could withstand uh, a, a high-speed vehicle crash at some, probably not allowed to tell you how fast you need to go to break through the fence. Um, <laughs> to get into the data center, you have to go through something they call a man trap, and it's a, it looks like a phone booth, and what you do is you go in and it weighs you, and there's a scale, and it has a decimal point, um, and then there's 10 digits to the right of the decimal point. And when you go in, you get weighed, and when you come out, you get weighed. And I thought, oh, that makes sense. They don't want someone to steal something. That's a, that's a good practice. And they said, actually, they're more concerned about you bringing something in to the data center and leaving it behind. Um, they have cameras in every aisle of this data center and every server rack that's there. There's security, you know, 24-7 monitoring the building. When a hard drive in a server is decommissioned and is out of, it comes to its end of life, they put it through a machine that shreds, shreds it into 300 pieces. And so when you talk to an enterprise customer who has very high level of security and sophistication, and you say, this is what we do at our data centers, what are you doing here? They usually give you kind of a blank stare because their data center's in the basement, it's in a room that's unlocked, and they don't know what's happening down there at that moment in time. So I do think the cloud has some challenges and we can get into those, but I think it provides a high level of security in that regard. Thank you. Can I add something on the cloud side? Yes, please. Um, yeah, so, sorry, because I, I missed that part of your, your question. So you might think that, intuitively speaking, if you keep something in the cloud with somebody else, it would be less secure than if you had it, you know, on your in your own home, right? So the idea that you know people don't come into your house and, and take stuff, um, and that's true, and and it isn't. It is true that um, that if you're storing information with a third party, then if the government goes to that third party and asks for that information, you might wind up having lesser protection and the government had to come to you to ask for it. I mean, the people in this room, I'm sure you're not trying to hide a lot from the government. Maybe, maybe you are. You don't seem like you would be. Um, but, but the point is, is that technically that's a good. However, you know, note that it's really a function of the condition in which it's stored. So if it's something is stored encrypted, right, where it's protected, it's, it looks like gobbledygook unless you have a key to it. Um, well, then it can be just as secure in, in the cloud as it, is, um, as it is in your house. And so if you were to look to, for a provider, one of the things you might look at is, do, do they encrypt their, um, your information in such a way that not even they can look at it? Right, that only you have the keys to it, uh, and that's just as secure if, as, as having it in your in your own house. And so I'd say that it really it depends how secure it is, depending on how it's configured. 
So um, some of these devices which are showing up in people's homes, I, I actually just got this device, the Amazon Echo or Alexa. And I was so excited. You can talk to this device and it'll play BBC radio, whatever you want. And then you realize it's always listening to you, right? What's your take, feeling, observation? And of course, every company is trying to do this, right? Microsoft has a Cortana technology. Apple has things as well. What are your thoughts on, on devices like this? Well, I'll start with Rich, maybe. I, I, I actually don't have an Amazon Echo device, but I've heard very, very good things uh, about the device. I um, mean, you're right. We, you know, the, um, I think Google just had an event last week where they announced the Google Assistant, which is a similar, uh, a similar uh, uh, business model. It, it, it's interesting. I mean, I, I think it, 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 it just interested what Ryan learned over the day because I think a lot of this about artificial intelligence and these devices get smarter as they, as they listen to you more. They learn and they learn your preferences and they can anticipate your needs. It is. You know, it, it does touch on on it gets very deeply into the privacy topic, and it, it reminds me of the and I, particularly when you think about it from a, a retail store perspective, um, it, it's fascinating um, what you can learn about a person if you understand what their purchasing habits are. And there was a case that got a lot of attention a couple of years ago involving Target department store, and it was a case involving. The father was at home, um, and uh, he had a 16-year-old daughter, and the mail comes, and in the mail comes these a lot, a whole bunch of adverts from Target, sort of advertising pregnancy uh, uh, products for his, addressed to his 16-year-old daughter. He was furious, and so he went into Target, and he found the manager, and he said, stop doing this, this is a terrible thing, and I can't believe what an irresponsible uh, retailer you are, and he went home. And then a week later, he had to come back to Target, and he apologized, and he said, I'm sorry, I, there was apparently some things happening in my house that I wasn't aware of. Um, and so essentially what happened was Target, the, the daughter was buying, you know, a, I don't know exactly what she was buying, I assume in-home pregnancy tests or something along those lines. Target knew that that was happening, knew who she was, knew where she lived, knew her address, and, and then, you know, did some direct marketing. Um, so it is, it, 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 it gets into some of your very deepest areas of privacy and concerns, and I think that goes to Ryan's point is you got to make sure you know who you're you're dealing with and doing business with and sharing that information with and ensuring that you've got both transparency into what they do with your information and how they treat it so transparency I'd say is probably number one and then the second thing you want to look for is control you know do you have the ability to say I you know I want to be anonymous or I don't want this information or I don't want you to store it for some length of time or things of, of that nature just um anecdote I, I heard, and this is first person, so I believe it's true. Uh, there's, there's a vice president of a company, a hardware company, which is not a US company, which is a smart TV with a built-in camera. And this vice president in his own home, in, in the, he has a TV, but he's made sure he has a piece of tape on that camera, because he doesn't know when it's on. So, <laughs> so going back to the, but David, I'd love to get your thoughts as well. Sure. Um, Clearly, as computing evolves, the way we interact with it will change and get smarter. So we will talk to things in the future because we talk to people. The issue around security and privacy is what are we talking to? If we're talking to the simply the device that sits on our counter, probably no issue unless somebody comes in and steals the device. But that's generally not how they work because they need the computing power of online services, the cloud essentially behind it. And I go back to if you're not paying for the product, you are the product issue. So the real issue you have to wonder about is the target one, which is, so they're answering your questions, they're using a lot of compute power to do that, what else are they doing with that information? If it's simply the interface, that's fine, assuming they keep that secure in whatever way they fashion. If they are making inferences beyond what you think your use of that system is, then I would say that's an issue. And, I, and I, I, to Rich, it's exactly it. You need to understand what they're actually doing with the data. But the interface mode of speaking, generally speaking, is OK. There have been some interesting problems. And the talking Barbies that repeat back have had some really interesting. It's interesting what your kids actually say when you're not there kind of thing, and it might be there's uh, the Furbies of a long time ago, if you remember them. There was a very famous write-up about one where there was a, uh, a paternity argument in a house. 
and the Furby kept repeating that when the neighbors came over. So <laughs> some of these things are, you know, it, it moves us in a direction. You've essentially, even though it's a device, you've now added it to your family, if you will. And like anything you would add in, you need to think about that. Right, so, so sometimes you, we talk about um, Amazon Echo and some of these products as part of the Internet of Things. Have you guys heard this sort of idea, the Internet of Things? This is, um, and so a, a couple of observations about Echo, right? So I'm a little less, I'm a little less sanguine about it than my co-panelists. Um, so number one, um, you know, if you're not, um, uh, if you're not paying for something, you, you're the product, right? That's, that's been, you know, a, a statement that's been holding true in the area of social networks. In the Internet of Things, we have a different saying, which is there is no Internet of Things. There's only other people's computers in your house, okay? And what does that mean? It means that, you know, Amazon uh, provides you a service. They want to be, they want you to buy it, so they want it to be valuable to you. Um, but it's Amazon. It's Amazon in your house. And I'll give you a, a small anecdote about how you know that. So I was at my sister's house, and she has uh, Amazon Echo. And at some point, you know, we have two kids, and, and, and Nina and her husband have two kids. And, we, you know, they were just running amok. And at one point, we just got so tired, we said, Alexa, which is how you, you know, get Amazon Echo to, to pay attention to you. Alexa, Alexa, just tell us a story, right? And Alexa paused for a second and said, um, I'm sorry, it doesn't look like you have an Audible account. And I said, Alexa, what's, what's Audible? And they said, oh, uh, Audible is Amazon's wonderful service for, uh, you know, storytelling. You know what I mean, and basically? And, and so the idea was that, like, they, that, that Amazon was trying to nudge us to purchase Audible, which is a, which is a repository of, uh, of audio books, right? Um, the second thing I would say is that while I tend to agree that an oral interface is no different from, you know, anything else you might work with, um, it, it is a little interesting and strange to have something in your house that you are hardwired, right, to react to as though it were a person, okay? Because, you know, we're really hardwired to react to anthropomorphic technology as though it were a person. How does it feel to be in a space where something is always waiting to talk to you, right? Always there, right? Do you ever really feel alone? Do you ever experience solitude if your phone and your devices and everything else are, feel like people to you that are ready to talk to you at any given time, right? Now, I'm not sure we fully appreciate the effect of that. So there's nothing, nothing to do necessarily with more data being collected or less. Just the very idea that you come home and you're not alone because Alexa's there, or Siri's there, or M is there, or Cortana's there. I think that's gonna wind up being profoundly different in certain interesting ways. Any response to Ryan's take on? I, I think he's right, but we wouldn't, we wouldn't talk, I mean, so voice interface, perfectly fine. Something's waiting to listen to you. You know, the keyboard's waiting for us to type. Uh, you know, I, I but, 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 but we're, not, we're not hardwired to think of it as social, right? You know well, what I mean? I think um, it, Ask a millennial, they may have a different opinion. Um, but again, because we speak, it is not exactly private, like a keyboard. So, and when we have vocal interactions with people, we use different behaviors than if we were to send them mail. So uh, we'll have to adapt as these things. Maybe, I mean, th there are studies that suggest, for example, that people are more willing to pay for coffee on the honor system if you put a pair of eyes over the collection plate than if you put flowers. And not only does that effect seem very statistically significant effect, it's robust. And so it's the same effect Lee Sprower and her colleagues found after week nine than it was at week two. Um, also, it turns out that we respond to polite reciprocity by, um, by uh, machines. And so studies out of Stanford suggest that um, you're more likely to answer a question about uh, when you were born, which is important, your date of birth or whatever it happens to be, if the computer offers something. So the computer will say, I was built in 2007, when were you born? And we are more likely to answer those questions. We are hardwired to react to anthropomorphic technology as though it were really a person, arguably because we evolved at a time when there were no fake people, right? I mean, it was advantageous years and years ago to be able to detect who in your universe was a, was a friend or a foe, you know, but, but you know, we, and, and we've sort of, and, and this is a whole area of study called cons, uh, con, um, uh, Computers as Social Actors, is pioneered by Byron Reeves and Cliff Nass and, and Lee Sproul and Melissa Bateson and others, and anyway, I think it's a real thing, I, I, I really do, I mean, I, I think that we, I think that it represents a real qualitative change that we're talking to things now.
No, I, I, I think I agree with both Dave and Ryan. I mean, I, the, what it brings to my mind is, we were chatting about this in the back of the room, I mean, there was the whole, uh, I don't attend, but at the Davos uh, event this year, there was a big, uh, I think a book that was um, put out by the founder of the organization called Klaus Schwab about the fourth industrial revolution, who essentially talking about all of the, you know, what's coming with all of this, these advances in technology and it's, whether, you know, the, I think one of the leading examples is the, the self-driving car kind of example. Um, and so there's all these benefits, certainly, that you could imagine that would come from all this uh, artificial intelligence and, and machine learning and things that technology can do. But what, what Schwab points out is there's, there, are, there are some real disruptive downsides that are coming as well. I mean, there's, you know, you can imagine a world, I suppose, if the self-driving car, which is a reality today, uh, advances further, um, you know, you, you see cabs driving by here on Bellevue Way. I mean, how long is it gonna be before cab drivers are no longer uh, part of the economy or truck drivers or, or there, there, you could, there's all sorts of things you could think about from a technology standpoint that would be just tremendously disruptive. And it's, I think it's, you know, those of us who are, in the industry, I think I have a real responsibility to start to think about some of those things and, and think about how we can best address them and you know some of the skilling and retraining and some other things, but there's some tough problems. Do you see any so emerging market-based solutions, business solutions that might start addressing some of these questions, or do you think that's going to be more an evolution over the next few years? Well, Meaning, where should I invest my money? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, one of the things that we think about from a cloud computing standpoint um, is energy consumption. Um, we are a massive consumer of electrical power. Um, happily, we're here in the state of Washington where so much of that electrical power that we consume is clean power. Um, but we consume quite a lot today, and we're on a path to consume more, as do others in the industry in this space. So. So sustainable, environmental sustainability is a big issue. Um, in the developing world, I just had the opportunity, I was in Kenya a few weeks ago, um, and had an opportunity to visit um, a really innovative, clever company that started up called M, M Kappa. Um, and essentially what this company has created, um, if you go to rural Africa, uh, you'll find you know, rural farmers uh, living you know, on very low incomes who live in maybe one or maybe two rooms. It's essentially one room with usually maybe a curtain that divides the, the room between a sleeping quarters and a living quarters. They're often made out of mud. They're sort of made out of, of mud with a corrugated sheet metal roof. Um, and they have no electricity at all. They have no TV, they have no radio, they have no light. Um, and you know, essentially if you want light, um, and if your children need to study, they study by the light of a kerosene lamp, which in a small confined space like that is not, it's, it's fairly toxic. Um, and it also turns out kerosene's not cheap. Um, the average family will spend about $200 a year on kerosene. So what this company has come up with, um, and, the ch and the challenge for electricity is the power companies don't want to run the lines, it's too far away, it's not very profitable, and it turns out power is actually pretty easy to steal, hard to shut off when people don't pay. You have to send somebody to the house to turn it off, and then they get somebody to come and turn it back on. So what this company did called MCAPA, these are, they, they came out of a, a mobile phone payment system company called M-Pesa, but they essentially created a small device. They put a solar panel on your roof, they have a small device that's connected sort of through the, through the mobile phone network, uh, so it's connected. Uh, they have two LED lights that you put on your ceiling. Um, they have a flashlight that you can charge from the solar cell. Um, they have a radio, so you get a radio. Uh, and they have another plug that has sort of something for your cell phone or other devices that you can charge. Um, and you pay $35 for a deposit when you pick it up. Um, and then you pay 50 cents a day for the next 365 days. And then at the end of that, you own this thing outright. And the way that they get people to pay is if you don't pay, they know. And because you pay using your SIM card on the phone, they turn off the power. They disable the device. Um, and so people pay. And they have, they have now wired something like 330,000 homes across Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. So it's really exciting. And so we're actually getting involved with them partly because we are now a 100% clean energy company. We don't do that all through clean energy, but we offset where we do use carbon by basically investing in things like this as far as carbon offsets. Thank you. So we're going to 
change uh, gears to public accountability in terms of larger questions. And to do that, we're going to show you a clip uh, which uh, features Michael Hayden, who's, who was a former director of the CIA and, and the NSA, uh, talking in a very interesting clip here. You've described this debate that has uh, that has developed as a result of, of, uh, of, of more consideration of encrypting data. You've described it as a medieval morality play. Without revealing your position, without revealing your position, give us both sides of the argument sure. as you see it. So on the government side, it, it, so, so the issue here is end-to-end -end unbreakable encryption. Should American firms be allowed to create such a thing? And you've got Jim Comey on one side saying, I am- FBI really, director. Sorry, yeah, the director of the FBI. I am really going to suffer if I can't read Tony Soprano's email, or if I've got to ask Tony for the PIN number before I get to read Tony's emails. And, and Jim Comey makes that, makes that complaint, and, and I get it. That, that, that is right. There, there, there is an unarguable downside to unbreakable encryption. Uh, on the other side is the argument, the question you ask is, on balance, okay, is America more or less secure with unbreakable end-to-end -end encryption, regardless of whether Jim can read Tony's emails. Right, so, so the one side is the business wants to be able to do it, uh, to be able to assure their customers that your data can, will, will start and end uh, its transit uh, safe. On the other side is government saying, wait a second, uh, this is gonna fall in the hands of the wrong people, right. uh, and it's gonna make our lives difficult. You were there. So this was a follow-up from the famous Apple FBI um, case which which happened a few months ago and this is about should we have unbreakable encryption or not and the, and the pros and cons so David I'm going to go to you since I think you mentioned Michael Hayden is a friend as well so you don't have to agree with everything he says but, but I'd love to get your take first you know on that case and how you see it and then how you interpret the um, this case of unbreakable encryption versus not so let me do them in reverse order if you will um, I actually weighed in on the unbreakable encryption back during the clipper chip time, if, for those who don't know it, what it was. But there was at one point, encryption was actually on the ITAR list. It was considered a munition, an arm. At one point, I was a registered arms dealer because I taught crypto, which I find very bizarre. But nevertheless, that's how it worked. Um, and I argued that you should not stop break, um, unbreakable encryption, though that's, I hate that term because outside of a one-time pad, there is nothing that's unbreakable. But at in, in any rate, you can't stop the progress of the production of encryption technology. Michael Hayden argued uh, that it was better for the overall protection of the country, for the security of the country, to let it go through. My argument with him at that time was a different one, but on the same side, which was if you institute bans on encryption or modifications to them in this country, then people will simply use encryption from elsewhere. It, is, it, it crosses borders, it's just knowledge. So it is something that's just not feasible to restrict. It's just knowing how to do something. And having people and companies in the United States use non-US encryption actually is a detriment to national security because the FBI, the National Security Agency, would then be faced with encryption they knew nothing about and would have to learn about it before they began to attack it. So at least if it's US born, they have some idea of what it is and they can find its weaknesses if there are any to be had from that. So the second one, let's go back to the Apple thing just very quickly. So my take, uh, I had the opportunity to, to advise some of our representatives on that. And when they asked sort of who's at fault, um, I said they were. Because quite frankly, no one appointed Apple to make the decision about what society needs. No one appointed the FBI to make the decision about what society needs. The legislature, our elected officials, should have been doing this, and they haven't. And they've left it to the courts to interpret things based on cases that aren't exactly there and laws that weren't designed for this. So the two pieces that go together with this, 
I find both sides sort of didn't tell the truth, if you will, or at least spun things in their own way. For one thing, I, I dislike Apple saying they were building back doors because my understanding of a back door is something that you can access remotely and people don't know you've done it sort of thing, where you actually physically had to have the phone. And all it did that they were asking Apple for was to do something they had done in the past and thus knew how to do, which was to limit the default on how many bad guesses would then wipe the phone. The FBI still had to physically possess the phone and still had to make the guesses. Turns out they're pretty good at guessing. The other issue is that the owner of the phone gave permission because the phones are owned by San Bernardino County. So they are San Bernardino City. They were phones that were, you know, so this was the perfect case for the FBI to bring to the courts. On the other hand, the All Writs Act was a wee bit of a stretch. Uh, if you don't know what that does, it basically compels people to do something they know how to do but don't want to do for the good of all with compensation, et cetera. Yet true, Apple knew how to do this. But that was a law from the late 1700s. It's not really something that's applicable for what we do today. Um, so the issue is I can actually see both sides very, very clearly on what they wanted. And from Apple's point of view, I think it had less, this is my own opinion, I think it had less to do with what they stated publicly than what they feared, which was if they do this for the US government, then the Chinese government will ask them to do the same or pick some arbitrary government for which you do not want to do that task for. And the only way that they can really say they're not going to do this is to say we don't do it for any government, we don't have the capability. And I think that was sort of the going in position. On the other hand, the FBI has a, an, a lawful duty to pursue what they're supposed to pursue, what their mission is. And it wasn't their whim. They went to a federal judge who issued a court order. So, I mean, it's not just the FBI wishing to do something. The judicial system was behind them and went through this. Normally, one complies with judicial orders. You can obviously say that you don't want to and you can challenge them in court, et cetera. But from both sides acted in accordance with their best interest and what they thought were true things. When we get to a situation like that, then it says somebody needs to make a decision for society. And I think that's where we should get our legislatures to decide how society should work on these and embed that in law. I have had friends at the FBI who have said, we enforce the law. You change the law, we'll enforce the new law. It doesn't matter what it is, that's our job. That's sort of my sort of broad general take. Ryan, would you like to respond? I, I mean, I just, I completely agree with everything you said. I mean, Come on, I, that's too boring. We no, need to all right, well, I mean, so, it's, so it's hard to disagree. I mean, so, so on the one hand, right, if we ban encryption in the United States, uh, folks will just, it's just math. And people will get the math from some other place and use it. Um, uh, you know, not only would I worry about the prospect that the FBI is not uh, familiar with it, but also the prospect that whoever designed that encryption did create a backdoor we don't even know about, and therefore some other government would be able to get at our stuff. I mean, what I would what I would add is that. Um, Remember I said at the beginning that one of the ways to protect yourself, one of the most efficient ways is to use the market? So this is a really interesting area where that's true, right? So you can insist that a company like Microsoft or a company like Apple would protect your stuff, right? But what's interesting in this space is the role of the government. And so without disagreeing with anything you said, I would just add that if, if, if Apple makes a promise to you that is like, um, we'll never share your data with a third party, okay? And then they go ahead and share your data with the third party. Do you, do you know what happens? The Federal Trade Commission goes after them because they made a promise to you and then they were deceptive and the, and the FTC has the authority to go after deception, right? But the FTC is an enforcement agency in that way, right? So if Apple says, we'll never give your information to the government, and then they give it to the government. Another government agency is not going to hold them to task. Do you see why that would be, right? So it's really up to us to say, fine, I'm never using your product again. Um, and so it's important to note that vis-a-vis -vis the government, the government itself will not act as a check, and therefore it has to be us wearing our consumer hats. But I have to say that I just, I think everything you said is wise. I mean, I remember, um, 
Not long ago, a few months ago, I got a chance to interview uh, Director Brennan, who's the director of the CIA. And that very same, uh, that evening before, actually, we talked about it at breakfast, he himself, his personal accounts had been hacked, right? And he was very much a, a, a fan of having very, very good security, including encryption around, your, around consumer products, because he and his family were, were essentially... Um, uh, really terrorized by by hackers, um, you know. Uh, but that's not to say that the CIA doesn't do everything in its ability to try to make sure it has awareness of what's going on in the world. Right? I mean, so yeah, I, I just completely agree. and would just add a couple of things. Rich, um, are, are you going to make it more interesting? Well, I've, I, 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 yeah. <laughs> let me a couple of things. One is to say our journey to encryption. We've been involved in encryption for a long time, but I will say, um, you know, it was it was the We've got very focused on it in June of 2013, or, or actually it's more like October of 2013, and this was all related to Edward Snowden. And you know, June of 2013 is when Edward Snowden fled to Hong Kong and then landed in Russia with, I don't know, what he had five laptops and an enormous amount of data that he had taken away from the, uh, the national surveillance agencies, um, security agencies, um, NSA. Um, and uh, and what happened to us and to Google and to Yahoo and to you know, others in the industry is the media turned on us and said, oh my gosh, you are such bad people, you technology companies, you US technology companies, because you are you appear to be just cooperating fully with the NSA and you've given them unfettered access to all this data about, about US citizens. And we said quite forcefully, absolutely not. That's not what we've done. We, we don't do that. We, we, we respond appropriately to law enforcement when we're required to do so, but we do it on an individual basis. We scrutinize each request and so on. But the media couldn't figure it out because they said, how could that be? Because he's got so much data. And then it was in October of 2013, the Washington Post wrote an article, and it was about Google and Yahoo, but it I'm sure applied equally to us and others, which the article basically said that the NSA was essentially tapping into the undersea cables that transited between the data centers of these companies. And so they were essentially not, and that's when the media then became like, oh, well, maybe that explains it. You, weren't, you guys aren't cooperating. The government's resorted to self-help, and they're just basically mining your data without your permission, which didn't make us very happy. But what we did, and the rest of the industry did then, is we all stood up and said, look, we're not only going to you know, encrypt data that travels from the customer to our data centers, which is, had been our practice, and we're not only going to encrypt data as it sits in our data center, which is sort of referred to as data at rest as you sit it in, as you store it, but we're also going to encrypt that data that, travel, that transits between our data centers. So we're encrypting data every way we can to make things more difficult. Um, and so we did that and others. And then you know, the other thing we did in this space is we've spent a lot of time suing the United States government, and I say that as they are probably one of our best customers. Um, and we also, you know, we work with them closely on many, many things, but we also have our differences of opinion. So we've sued them for transparency. Um, we've sued them so we can say more about their requests that they serve upon us um, under national security orders and other things. Um, we've more, re with the most recent lawsuit uh, we brought was essentially and this, Ryan, goes sort of your point about putting your data with a data center. There are There is a risk, which is if the government can come to us, if you, if, if any one of you in, 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 in this audience decides to sign up for one of our Outlook.com email accounts and we have your email, the government could come to us and say, we need you to produce that email. And not only do we need you to produce that email, you can't tell your customer. It's too important. It's got to be kept secret. It would, if you tell anybody, it will mess up our prosecution, so you're not allowed to say anything. And what we found, and when looking at this, is that this secrecy order or gag order is massively overused in our point of view. There is, an, there is undoubtedly appropriate circumstances when you should use it. You know, there are criminals that cannot, you know, that are in the middle of an investigation that if they did find out, you know, that would, that would be a bad thing. And, and there are appropriate circumstances when you'd use it, but it's being overused in, in that respect. So we're fighting on some of those issues. And on the Apple case, we've come down on Apple side, but I agree. I mean, you know, it, it, it is really, Congress needs to act. Dave mentioned the All Writs Act. It was first enacted in 1789. I think it was last amended in 1911. Um, and it's being applied to modern technology, which is just, it's not fit for purpose. And so it's time for Congress to step up and do something. So if I can do a follow on just real quickly. So I take one small exception to one of your points, which is you can't have a 
prom a consumer promise to act illegally, and if the if a federal court asks for that data and it's subject to laws, then the promise doesn't apply in that case. Yeah. And the, the second piece, which you didn't play all of the Hayden thing, but one of the things that Hayden talked about is, so when the NSA decided that they didn't want to ban encryption, they're actually the ones that removed it from the ITAR. So NSA said, sure, crypto everywhere. That caused them to shift the way they did business. And what they shifted to is what they've now come under fire for, which is the metadata collection. Uh, and there's a long history on what is metadata and why they were able to do that legally, though you might not like it, it is not illegal. That doesn't apply to the FBI. So there's different issues. That's Title 50, which is intelligence operations. They have a set of laws that govern them. They cannot do this against US persons. The FBI deals in Title 18 in addition to Title 50, and that's criminal law, and it applies to US persons. One of the problems the FBI has said which never gets much press, is, OK, if you want to go give me complete encryption, therefore I go dark, I have to have something else to work on. And the problem is the court system is so slow that new techniques, simple example is using, fetching the GPS from uh, the navigators in cars. It took a long time before the courts would allow that as evidence. And even then, it's in conditional format. Uh, they prohibited the FBI from attaching trackers to cars without a search warrant. And so the alternatives to them are significantly limited by criminal law interpretation by the courts, which is why it really needs to be Congress to step in and t say what the will of the people are, what is the outcome they want in that balance between our privacy and the, and, the, and the quite legitimate things that the FBI pursues in a criminal matter. Yeah, but so, I, you know, um, you're, you're, I take your point about the fact that you can't, you, you can't, Apple can't promise, like, we're never going to give anything to the government, and then they're compelled to by a statute. You know, of course not. I'm, I'm more thinking of uh, a claim like, we couldn't turn it over if we wanted to. Do you see what I mean? And then the government comes along and says, you've got to turn it over, and they're like, fine. You know what I mean? Like, that was what I'm worried about, right? The other thing I would say is that, um, you know, the government can get uh, virtually anything um, with, with, with adequate process, okay? It can't get things that are encrypted because unless you force the party to decrypt it, right? Um, so if something's hidden away, if it's... But metadata can't be encrypted. And the reason that metadata can't be encrypted is think of metadata as being, like, Think of the as the content of being like what's in the letter that you sent, and the metadata being where to whom you sent it, the address of the person to whom you sent it. If you were to encrypt the address to whom you sent it, <laughs> your postman would look at it and say, I, "I don't know. This is just some black lines. I have no idea where to send this." Right? They wouldn't literally know where to deliver it. So, you know, the the, the question is whether or not uh, the FBI could make greater use of metadata. Um, sure, right? But maybe they would have to go through, can they put a GPS device on your car? They can. They just have to go and get a warrant. I mean, the case that you're referring to, United States v. Jones, the Supreme Court case that you need a warrant in order to put the track people over um, a long uh, period of time by putting a GPS on their car. You know, in that particular case, the police in, in, in D.C. got a warrant. They got a warrant to do this. They had to put the thing on the car in, the st in D.C., in the district, within 30 days. They waited like 32 days, and they put the GPS device on in Maryland, right? Th th that was the problem. It was outside of the scope of the warrant, and the government said you had to get a different warrant. So my point is that, like, sometimes law enforcement has to get a warrant. You know, and, and now, but the problem, of course, of going dark is no amount of warrant is going to get you encrypted data. Like, you know, that's just not possible. Um, yeah. I, I, will, I will point out that, you know, this is a worldwide problem, and other countries have dealt with it differently. The UK, with something called the Ripper Act, and I cannot, for the life of me at the moment, remember what it stands for, um, something Data Protection Act. They, since they don't have a Fifth Amendment, can compel you to give the encryption keys. And if you don't give them, that is a, essentially a violation of law in and of itself, and they can lock you up. So 
Now, every country is dealing with this in a different way. I actually think we're among the better in trying to figure out how that works, quite frankly. So this is going to keep me up at night. So, so as a revenge, I'm going to ask each of you, what keeps you up at night? So starting with you, Rich, what, what's the, your biggest challenge? I mean, I guess in some ways, if, if, if keeping it relatively in the, in the I can tell you about other things about my, my life, but I'll keep it in security and privacy and data. Privacy um, is, yeah. the, um, the th I mean, the, the, law and the balance between personal privacy and public safety is a super hard question. We've talked a lot about that, so I won't spend time on that. I think the other one I think we struggle a lot with that is hard is sort of just jurisdictional issues and national sovereignty issues and you know do borders and you know matter in cyberspace and you know we have a we have another lawsuit pending against the United States government um, and this one involves essentially um, a case that started a couple of years ago essentially it was a narcotics case a federal prosecutor in New York City was was essentially uh, served us with a search warrant and said hey I, I have you have an email address you know John Smith at Outlook.com or whatever it was, um, you know, here's a search warrant, uh, or the court order, the judge's, uh, magistrate judge has ordered you to provide me with the, essentially the, the, the contents of this mail. And we looked at it and we said, whoa, hang on a minute, this is actually not here in the United States, it's actually in Ireland, which we have a big data center outside of Dublin. Um, and we backed that data center up in Amsterdam. And so we said, well, if the data, if that email account is sitting in Dublin, then that means that that's a European citizen because we actually put our European citizens' email in Europe. We keep it there. So we said, let me just, ex we'll just explain this to the prosecutor. I'm sure he'll understand. We'll say, hey, hey, you need to go talk to the Irish government. There's this thing called a mutual legal assistance treaty, which exists between Ireland and the United States. The whole purpose of this thing is for law enforcement on either side of the Atlantic so they can cooperate each other and each can help the other get evidence from each other's country as they need it to prosecute a case. So we said, please use the MLAT process. That's the right way to go. And they said, no, thank you very much. That takes too long. Give me the data. You're a US citizen. I have jurisdiction over you. Give me the data. So we, we went to court. Judge at the magistrate level disagreed who, who issued the subpoena, so not, not a big surprise. We took it to the district court level. The district court disagreed with our point of view. We've taken it now to the, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals um, and made the case in front of a three-judge panel. We're now waiting for that decision. Um, but it's, for us, it's a very big deal. For our customers, it's a very big deal. For our European customers who actually look at the Edward Snowden examples and something prior, that predated that called the USA Patriot Act and think that it's completely unsafe to do business with a, a US internet service provider or an uh, IT company. So for us, it's huge. Um, now, we can win in court, and that would be great. But we may not. We haven't had a good track record so far. But that's not the only venue in which we're fighting this fight. We can win at the White House. Um, you know, President Obama has shown some interest in looking at these issues in a more balanced way, perhaps, than uh, currently, I think, the, his, his prosecutors are, are exercising the law. And we could win in Congress as well. And so that is something hugely important to us. And um, it, it, there are times when it does indeed keep me awake at night. You, you sort of stole my joke. I wasn't going to say the cat, but <laughs> but aside from that, um, my issue actually, what keeps me up is something we term cyber physical systems. So where cyberspace meets the real world, the industrial controllers that control factories and dams and the electrical power grid. And so I, most people call it the internet of things. I like Cisco's term, which is the internet of everything sort of everything thrown together, but it, particularly these controllers, because historically speaking, the people who invent this technology and plug it into the internet haven't really thought through a lot of the security implications before it was put in, and much of this stuff is very old, and it's very attackable, and it is being attacked. And just as a simple example was a water system in Queensland, Australia, where a former employee hacked into the system uh, and control the valves on the water distribution system and cross-connected the sewage and the fresh water, which destroyed the water supply for the city until they could purge everything. And the Australian government was forced to truck in fresh water, which worked for a little town. It would not work for Seattle or Chicago or something along those lines. Those types of systems are incredibly vulnerable 
um, simply because we're now connecting them, they're now online. And I think this is going to be our challenge going forward. They're sort of, this is the one that keeps me up. And I didn't get a chance to answer you, where should you invest? Wireless spectrum. <laughs> because everything we've got that wants to talk to everything wants to do it wirelessly. And there's just not enough spectrum out there to do that. So people are going to get crowded and pushed and shoved. And people who own that spectrum are going to be raking in gold. I, I, you know, for obvious reasons, I wish I'd gone before Dave. Um, that Because that's about the scariest thing. <laughs> I can imagine. I, I, I feel like I'd have to say, like, what keeps me up at night is these scientists that are going to reanimate dead brains and gonna create zombies. You know what I mean? Like, that's actually that's v even scarier potentially than this, but nothing else. No, but in seriousness, um, you know, I'm, I'm actually going to, uh, for my pick of what keeps me up, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the consumer uh, privacy side. Um, I'm worried about a trend that I'm seeing where companies, uh, and not those represented tonight, but companies will. Um, use what they know about consumers in order to take advantage of them, right? So for example, um, one uh, marketing firm did some research and found out that uh, women feel worse about themselves at particular times during the week, like on Tuesday mornings, and suggested to its clients that that's when you should advertise beauty products at that particular time. Um, recently it was revealed that Uber um, uh, did a study in which it found that people were more willing to pay surge prices when they were almost out of batteries. Right? And I'm not saying Uber actually does that, but the point is, is that if you know a tremendous amount about your consumers and you can control the interaction with them, right? Um, reach them anytime, anywhere, design the app, you know, design the app, design the website. Um, it does give you the, the, the um, ability at least to manipulate. You know, if you think about it for just a moment, you know, you know why everything costs $9.99, right? I mean, it's because it feels like it's further away from $10 than it is. But imagine that it's not just that everything costs $9.99. Everything costs the most that you'd be willing to pay for it. And it's different for your neighbor and it's different from your friend. So I'm worried about the prospect of companies using what they know about consumers to manipulate consumers. It's a, it's a really disconcerting trend. And maybe I don't, I don't wake up in quite the same way as the uh, water supply being crossed with the sewage supply, but it is, it is disconcerting. But so um, this has been a fascinating discussion. I did want to open it up to uh, questions here. Um, if there are people, and I, I will look at my Twitter feed, but in person is even better. Hey, um, how do we reconcile the potential privacy implications of sharing uh, personal data towards the goals of collective learning, um, such as in the scope of personalized medicine? Uh, is it a necessary risk for a participant to open themselves up to privacy threats uh, now and in the future? Um, and if this is the case, will it create a bias in medical knowledge towards the ignorant and careless? <laughs> You know, there's, there's really great computer science research right now on how do you permit uh, people to feed their information into a system and not have it come back to potentially reverberate against them. I mean, even within Microsoft, like Cynthia Dwork's work on differential privacy is just brilliant. So it, as a computer science matter, it turns out to be possible to do that, right? I mean, you know, it's a little bit of a cat and mouse game because for every interesting thing that Cynthia comes up with, you know, Arvind Naranyan over at Princeton figures out a way to break it, right? So it, it, you go back and forth. Um, <laughs> I haven't thought about the idea of careless, <laughs> careless medicine. Um, mostly it's been pegged to white men, so maybe careless would be an improvement over, over that. Um, but, uh, but, but no, I, I think there are ways to do research without, without um, necessarily compromising privacy. So actually this has been going on for a very, very long time with the U.S. Census Bureau. They have something they call constructive queries. Uh, so they actually, what you don't want is to be able to ask a question of the census and ask a bunch of questions so that you can zero it down to knowing the information about one single person. And so what the Census Bureau does, believe it or not, behind all the scenes, is they keep track of who asks what question. And they keep computing the size of the database of, of recipients You know that that question will narrow down to. And when it gets below a certain threshold, they refuse to answer queries that impact on that. This has been going on since the 1970s. So there is 
in many of these things, there are technological ways to provide privacy to a large group. Where it gets of an issue is when you have to have a one-on-one -on -one talk with your physician about you. And clearly, you have to give something of yourself to that or he's not going to make a good diagnosis. The issue then becomes one of just general computer security on how well that is protected and, and the authorizations, et cetera, et cetera, which apparently we do rather poorly based on the evidence which I've seen. Time for one more. Thanks. Um, so maybe this is a follow-up to the um, Apple FBI series of discussions. Um, so I spent a lot of time at Microsoft, um, at UW alumni, I spent time in China, so I'm somewhat familiar with some of these issues. So I want to ask the panelists, do you feel like fundamentally laws will have applied differently in the offline world? We used to call it the real world, but I'll just say offline, versus online, like do the power of courts and subpoenas, do you think they, that we'll just diverge and there'll be one set of laws for the offline world and, and the online world? And if not, how do you bridge uh, and keep it together. Maybe I'll start. I, uh, my our, I, sort of our position is they shouldn't be different, um, and that's sort of partly you know, that's partly our position in this Irish case that I talked about. It's like sh certainly the United States government could use what we would refer to as technological brute force to force us to drag that data back. We can do it. We have the capability to go get that email out of Ireland and, and bring it back. But we sort of feel like it shouldn't be any different than if that was a piece of paper with the with the with you know the content on it sitting in this customer or this you know consumer of ours who sits in Europe somewhere in their desk drawer. The United States government could not, you know, go and without the support of the Irish government show up in country, you know, parachute in under the cover of darkness and, and break into the person's house and take this information out. So we don't think it should change at all because of the fact that it just happens to be digitized. So the concept of being able to police one's borders is a central thing to the whole idea of sovereignty. I mean, it's at 1648 in the Treaty of Westman. I mean, governments assert the right within a certain geographical boundary for a number of things. They, they, are, they own the exclusive right to use violence. Uh, they own the ability to describe what is criminal and not criminal within that space, et cetera. My guess is no government on earth is going to give up that right just because the internet transcribes multiple boundaries. Uh, so I don't think two sets of laws will ever work. What will have to work instead is to, and I hate to use the term because the Europeans use it in excess, but to harmonize uh, individual countries' laws about those things upon which we can agree and treat those the same and then have a reciprocity so that we can get to them. We do this already, for example, with child pornography. That's the one thing that the world agrees on, is absolutely bad, and if it's online, every government on the planet will help you chase it down. Uh, anything less than that, then we begin to bump heads on exactly who should do what and where, who has the authority, and, and, and literally, back to your question, on under whose law does it actually apply. There is an, a different format than law, which is treaty, so we could actually have treaties. We have one cyber treaty, the Council of Europe treaty, which the U.S. subscribes to, which does obligate all of the countries to treat some things the same way in terms of digital requests for data and what, what's uh, against the law, et cetera. But that just scratches the surface. So I think over time we're going to have to work these out. But there will always be outliers. I doubt very seriously that Russia will participate in the same programs, for example, or North Korea. So you know, we're, we're left with chaos, I think, for a little while. I haven't been doing this, but I'm gonna. I'm now gonna put my law professor hat on for a moment um, and just say that I don't. I don't know the answer. What I will say is that um, 
the metaphors and rhetoric and the way we talk about things really matters a lot, right? So you hear, for instance, the ACLU of Northern California repeatedly saying that when you store something in the cloud, it's like it's stored in a, um, a safety deposit box, uh, which we know a warrant requirement attaches to. And you see the um, uh, FBI, for example, saying, no, it's a lot more like uh, how your bank holds your records and therefore it's available under the third party doctrine, right? On encryption. Some people argue that encryption is a speech issue, like a free speech issue. Imagine that you're having a conversation with your friend in Italian, and the government comes along and goes, I don't really speak Italian very well, you need to switch over to English, right? That's gonna feel to you like a First Amendment problem, isn't it? I mean, if the government tells you what language to speak in um, as an obligatory um, matter, um, so perhaps the right metaphor is speech. Um, whereas if we just think about it as, um, as, uh, as something else, then, um, then it, it's not. And so what I would just say is that, is that you know, whether or not online and offline end up merging and, and what the legal protections are will, will turn in part on the mental models and metaphors that judges and society are prepared to accept. Okay, so I think we're out of time, but I'm hoping our panelists won't run away immediately after the uh, after the panel's over, and we'll get to a chance to talk to all of you. So, Ryan, David, Rich, this has been fascinating, and I will stay up at night after hearing many of these things. So, so let's give a round of applause to our panelists.